Um, all right, any uh, comments on the minutes? Do we have a motion on the minutes? I move we approve. They're excellent. Excellent. Carol uh, makes a motion to approve the excellent minutes, and Lori seconds the move to approve the excellent minutes. Any further discussion on the excellent minutes? All right, all those in favor of approving the excellent minutes, please. <clears throat> All those opposed to the meeting. And then all those abstaining. All right. The motion passes. Thank you. All right. Well, I have nothing to say. Nothing to say for myself. Um, uh, many of you are uh, so, uh, but I will note that our colleagues from over the mountains couldn't make it to the articulation meeting tonight. So, um, Clamont Community College and Architect will not be there, which is sad. But we are seeing many people <coughs> there at a later date or something. Um, just like yes. Yeah, well, so, and, and Greg Perkinson was supposed to go up and meet with um, uh, someone in the legislature around budget stuff, and he couldn't make it up the road either. Um, so we're all just going to sit here in the postcard. <laughs> um, but other than that, I really, I was racking my brain for anything I sort of need to tell you. And I can't really think of anything, but I'd be happy to answer any questions or give you the time back, because I know you have a full agenda. Okay. Um, the uh, two things I have are the Tuition Advisory Council continues to meet weekly. Um, this is the group that will eventually um, make a recommendation to the president about any tuition increases um, that uh, uh, she might recommend to the board of trustees. Um, the uh, other piece is if you're interested in learning what we're talking about, learning about what we're talking about, um, Oh, come on in. Um, uh, there's a website that we created that you go to the president's page. You'll see TAC. Just click on that. It has all of the minutes from all the meetings. It has materials that we've been using for training. The especially, um, well, the, the committee, all of us uh, have, have benefited from um, some training uh, because things change. And we also have some other materials that might be of interest. So. Um, we have four students on the committee, two um, from underrepresented um, populations, and two from ASSOU. Um, we have two faculty, two administrators, and then a bunch of other people who come and sit in on the meeting to help consult from budget and other places on the campus. Um, so there's that. Um, and if the meetings are open, so if you would like to sit in on one, you're more than welcome to. Um, and we also have a division director sitting in as well, and Matt um, will occasionally sit in, uh, uh, sit at the table. Um, we also uh, have uh, had four candidates on campus for the Honors College Director position, and thank you to Janet Fratella for um, chairing that search. We have four great candidates. One has taken another position, so we have three finalists now, and the committee has uh, giving me their feedback, uh, giving me its feedback, and kind of hurting my coming out. Um, and um, so I'll be, um, I shared that with President Schott, and I'll be um, hopefully making an offer to an individual very soon. And we had, if, if you attended any of the presentations or saw the videos, I think you'll agree that we had three really good candidates on campus for response. So, um, yeah. Can I ask you a question? When was that individual as a director of Honors College start? Start? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I haven't had uh, a direct, uh, like a, you know, a conversation about that. I didn't know if it but was I think, advertised. To start. Well, I think, no, it, it wasn't. But I think the committee got the sense that the, the candidates would probably be ready to go on June 15th or July 1st. Okay. 
and I mean be on the ground and right. be, they're all on semester system yeah. at their current institutions. Yeah. Best odds, governor's uh, recommended budget, back on our tuition status. Oh, I think that was back to me. Um, sure, why don't you take that? <laughs> <laughs> See, now normally I do it the other way. Here, you take it. I've got another one soon. I'll give this a day. Thank you. Um, I don't know if I can give you odds. I, mean, not, I don't think the governor's recommended budget will be the budget we end up with. She said, other people have said, that's not realistic. So we're not really worried about that. We're more worried about the it'll be only 40 million as opposed to the 120 million. And those are double digit tuition increases, I believe, even at 40 million. It has to get up to the 120 for us to keep it under 5%. Right, right. So well, that's gonna be my second question, is kind of worst case in the percentage increase if it's just 40. It is gonna be double digit, could be higher double digits to lower. Well, it's not going to be in the 20s, <laughs> I think. I think that's I mean, true. I mean, I well, think at some point... It's feel a whole lot better, right? right. Well, yeah. I mean, those are really tough questions, and we'll, we'll just have to uh, figure out um, do you, where do you make reductions? I mean, because if you don't put it all on the backs of students, then where do you, where do you cut costs? when 80% of your costs are in personnel. You don't want to cut personnel. What can you do? You know, I wish we were had some easier answers. I think that would be the, the sort of worst case with the budget, with the government's budget, is only 40 million. We think that's the worst case. And 120 just gets us to current service. Yeah, right. right. 120 just gets you back to Which is what Greg was supposed to be meeting with them today about, but he'll be on the phone with instead, trying to help them understand why our figures for current service level are higher than LFO, Legislative Finance Office, which is the 40 million. So it's getting them to trust our numbers, you know, believe that, um, you know, we know you're all working hard. It's sometimes hard to get them to believe that, right? Because faculty work looks different than other people's work. But um, that's not coming from us. We, we know what it means to teach three classes and to do it you know, on a quarterly basis and, um, and to advise students and all of the other things that you do. So, um, but they need to know how we're managing everything, not just faculty. I don't know. Uh, we'll just keep working on it. We're going to have more um, open sessions for students in particular. Um, I did, I should have mentioned, we had a cabinet to cabinet meeting with ASSOU this morning when we listened to their priorities and talked with them some about this. Senator Jeff Golden's going to be here on campus talking with students. Um, you guys can make your voices known to our local representatives as well so that they hear your stories. Right, about what you're doing and, and what you're dealing with. Well, did you say you had another question? No, that was, that was that's probably enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had a question. Um, I didn't get, really get to dig into this, but um, I got an email back to member saying that the um, Oregon Senate had, uh, had passed a measure um, allowing community colleges to be uh, four year degrees, and that now it goes to the House. Um, yep. How, so how right now they just talk about nursing, um, but the other potential uh, degree would be applied business, um, which we have. So these are things um, that RCC wants to offer? Uh, they, this is really uh, coming from a certain individual in the legislature um, who yeah. has this kind of as a pet project. Um, who may have a leadership position in one of the houses that may have already voted on it. <laughs> <laughs> <He's sorry. laughs> um, this kind of uh, bill has happened, I think, in 20 some odd other states already. In most cases, it's around applied degrees. It's not a broad range of the types of degrees that universities offer. Um, Pam Marsh was looking out for us and asked us if we wanted her to add some kind of language around 
um, only doing this if there's not a four-year institution in the region that could meet that need. Mm -hmm. um, but my understanding was that Kathy Kemper Pell from RCC did not support the bill. Um, so it's not a play by RCC <coughs> or KCC. Or, and our best defense against this kind of bill is what we're doing through the Southern Oregon Higher Education Consortium, where we're proactively talking with the community colleges so that we know what needs are, and we're all talking together how to meet them. So I would not be overly concerned about this. And it also was moving so fast and so furiously. I mean, it was a 29 to 0 vote. We felt like if we'd have tried to put much on the line to counter it, it would have probably done us more harm in terms of our funding request. So you play the politics of what do you want to make them angry about? Hmm. Any other questions from the nurse? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I right. uh, just have a couple of things from the AC meeting. Um, we all voted on a resolution in Senate uh, last time, and uh, the provost and president signed on it. So uh, we're, we're pleased with that. And um, Linda's uh, three-year contract is almost over, and so she's up for rehiring, I guess. And um, for the sake of transparency, there might be a questionnaire slash assessment of the president to get a feel of uh, how we f or get an idea of how we feel about uh, Linda's uh, contributions and uh, and performance on campus, and uh, not that it will make any difference in uh, the board's decision apparently, but uh, but at least to, to get a little idea. And uh, and I had said that for me personally, it would be a little bit hard to just have an open-ended question, as I don't know exactly what the uh, the role of the president or the responsibilities of the president. Uh, are, I mean, I know what most of, some of them are, but I don't really know, so it would be hard to, I said we might end up blaming Linda for something. Sue did, I don't think she <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought it was funny, she didn't think it was funny. <laughs> 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 yeah. Can I just add that I think the board continues to discuss this. Uh, they haven't decided what they want to do. Um, but I believe they want to uh, have some input in some way into sort of how the university is doing. And, and so by uh, connection, kind of how I'm doing. Um, yeah. Can I ask a question about that? Is this new because we have a board? Because I'm not aware in the past, somebody correct me, this is wrong, that a president had a Term. Like, uh, like a, you know, uh, some kind of official contract mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's typical, and the faculty senate has always led the charge with helping with that evaluation. And when I was senate chair, I delivered Elizabeth Zinzer's um, to her, and if there were questions or rebuttals, we well, sat down. That's no, different. That's, different. So it's, uh, that's the evaluation that goes out regularly yeah. on mm -hmm. administration. And that's not I'm done on the present on me until next year. It's out of cycle with the contract. So that's what I'm asking. Like, You're asking is, is this new? Contract. So this is new, this three year thing. Does anybody is that from the board? Well, I think previously OUS would renew the president's contract either every two or three years. But we never that would got. be the Chancellor's office. But mm -hmm. I think what President Schott's talking about is um, a, a, a new approach okay. to getting feedback from um, from various constituent groups on campus. Is that uh, fair? Uh, I was the one who suggested yeah. it. I mean, the board was talking about renewing my contract, and I said, well, you probably ought to just ask people anyway, and let them know that you're thinking about doing it. That's a good point. So yeah. that's, that's, okay, where, that's we where it are. came from. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's not, I, it is not that they have a lack of confidence in me and want to, you know, it's like you just want to have openness and transparency about things. Thank you. I thought it was a thing. Yeah. All right. That brings us to Jim Bauer. Hello. Hello. <laughs> How are you this morning? <laughs> this morning. <laughs> um, so I am Jim Bauer. That's correct. Um, and as of 
this last fall, I think I was in the affiliate faculty member in biology, and I made an arrangement with SOU. With the devil. <laughs> I think we were just discussing that, right? <laughs> so anyway, um, to take on another role here, actually it's a national role, so I'm uh, the executive director for the American Association of the Advanced of Science. Pacific Division. By the way, how many of you know that the executive director for that position has been at SVU for the last 17 years? Oh, I do. Okay. <laughs> Great. Roger. So, <clears throat> long story. Uh, some of it good, some of it bad. I agreed to do this. Um, and the, one of the consequences of being the director, my responsibility is to organize a meeting every year. And sort of by coincidence, I've been on the executive board of the AAAS, both national and the Pacific Division more recently. Um, everyone knows what AAAS is? No. It's an association with the dance of the science. It's about 140 years old. It's probably best known for publishing Science Magazine, which is one of the top two or three or four uh, peer-rated magazines, science magazines in the world. But it's actually a very active uh, organization in Washington, uh, providing advice and kind of big grants to do interesting things. The Pacific Division has been around for 105 years, um, and it used to be that <coughs> the AAAS had multiple divisions. They're down to three. The Pacific Division, the Arctic D Division, and the Caribbean Division. <laughs> but of all of those, the, the Pacific Division is the most active and has been largely due to, to Roger's effort, actually, over a long time. And, <coughs> and partially in honor of him, we thought we'd have the meeting in Ashland this year, and then it turns out I became the executive director, so that makes it easy to organize. <clears throat> so I'm really here to tell you about that meeting and to encourage you to participate. Um, so it is June 18th to 22nd, that's the week after driving uh, exams. Okay? Um, <clears throat> it is by tradition, and it will be in this meeting as well, highly interdisciplinary and cross-disciplinary. Um, it is a very, Triple is a very broad scope organization. The Pacific Division is even more broad scope than AAAS is. Um, so for example, our president this year is actually a, a, li a library scientist, which the downtown office would probably never do, um, but we do those sorts of things. Um, so it's sort of an interesting organization. The meeting will consist of symposia, workshops, posters, and oral presentations. Uh, by agreement with SOU's leadership, uh, students here get half price. SOU students have half price registration for the meeting, which means it's 26 bucks for a three-day meeting. It's pretty good. Um, actually, faculty presenters is 80, so that's got to be one of the cheapest meetings around. But it's a very good meeting. <coughs> and we care, like I said, about multidisciplinary cross-disciplinary. For example, uh, we're going to be doing a lot with music, art, uh, and theater, probably, uh, in the meeting. In fact, the opening for the meeting will coincide with the public opening for the art and science exhibit, which was set up as a consequence of this meeting coming uh, in June at the Schneider. We also this year are emphasizing local uh, community issues because many times when scientists come into a town, they arrive, they do their thing, they leave, and nobody knows and nobody cares. And that strikes me, especially in this day and age, is not being such a good idea or maybe there's something better we can do. <clears throat> so we've identified, working with the community, several issues, forest fires, uh, it's an issue. A diversification of agriculture is an interesting issue for this valley. Um, farm to table issues, climate change, aging and nutrition, uh, term, for example, aging turns out to be something that a lot of people around here are doing. Um, I was on the back of the Senate Caltech for a while, I didn't know about the cost of that. Anyway, and then science issues, and specifically issues that are um, interesting uh, contemporarily. The question is why would a scientist want to come to this meeting rather than to the hundreds of other meetings you can go to all the time in your discipline? So we're specifically focusing on interesting science issues. For example, the future of scientific publishing. It's very likely that the editor of science will be here. I'm talking to the people of nature, uh, several frontiers, several other big science publishing organizations that are coming and talking about that issue. Um, part of that involves, of course, what they're going to be charging universities for their services. This sort of an issue that's all tied up in there. 
The consequences of computer modeling for basic science. I'm a computational neurobiologist, so I've been working on this for a long time, and it's interesting. Uh, some of my former students are very big in AI now, so actually several of them have shoehorned and agreed to come here and have a session on the implications of artificial intelligence, um, culturally, economically, et cetera. <clears throat> my wife is a specialist in the microbiome, so if you know what that is, you have one. <coughs> um, if you're interested in knowing more about it, I'd let, love to have her tell you instead of telling me all the time. Um, but anyway, <laughs> so we're running a uh, special symposium, which will get the sort of national flavor of the microbiome. The future of precision medicine is another one. Um, it's an interesting subject um, and important. Uh, and then memory from a biological and engineering point of view. So engineers think about memory in a particular way, and neurobiologists think about it in a particular way, and it turns out that that's an interesting crossover. And I mentioned it's cross-disciplinary. We have a large focus. I have five minutes to get one more to go. Um, <clears throat> uh, so education is very important. Uh, we have a uh, symposium already set up on active learning for undergraduates, which I think is something of interest here. We have Portland State, University of Portland, uh, Portland Community College, I hope so, for a four-year degree soon. Anyway, uh, UCLA and Boise State, what we do with that. And then we have a lot of participation from historians and philosophers of science. Uh, so we have a very nice uh, history of science symposium on contemporary applications of medic, uh, medicine, all the Leopold's ecological thinking, medical energy and uncertainty, and notions of biodiversity. And then there's a very nice symposium that just came in uh, talking about community science, how you actually engage you know, uh, regular people in doing science, and that's going to be a So, we would really like to have this have an SOU flavor and participation from as many of you as possible. Uh, I'm working with Roxanne Bagel Coriel. This will actually approach her and said, Can we have a, sustain, a certification of sustainability? And she said, We've never done that here before for a meeting, but why not? So we're working on that. If you'd like to participate, I'm Bauer J at SOU, or just search Jim Bauer and the first punch in there. Um, so send me a note. If you'd like any of your own research, and it can be very broad based, a paid application, theater, anything. Okay, to be presented, that would be great. Um, happy if you have an idea for a symposium and you'd like my help in finding other people or if you know other people and you'd like to supplement it with people who play us, happy to work on that. Um, and I would love to come talk to any faculty groups who would like to have me talk to you about this meeting so that your faculty knows. Oh, can you yeah. When is it? I'm sorry. It's when? Uh, it's 2082. No. <laughs> it's uh, June 18th through the 22nd. So Excellent, thank you. I said it's the week after uh, uh, finals. And Jim, would you be able to send me those notes so we could put in the Senate Drive for everyone to access? Absolutely. And we're very, very interested in student participation. This meeting is characterized by students. Last year it was Cal State Pomona. There were 580 people there, and 300 of them were students. We like that. We get prizes and awards undergraduate, graduate, and high school students. So anybody that has any students that would like to present or even participate, I'd love to talk to you about that. Um, so, lots of stuff, yeah. Is there a place to get this information for? Yes, absolutely. So, yeah. <clears throat> so um, if you Google AAAS uh, Pacific Division. Like there's nothing on through, through our SOU um, portal for our there will be very soon. Whoever controls that, I'll talk to. You. Um, yeah, there will. Be. Also, I'm I'm talking I've talked to JPR, um, so also as a way to sort of get the word out. One last thing I mentioned way over my time, <clears throat> because we're really playing around with ideas for engaging the community. We're currently trying to organize what we call a science cafe night. So imagine first Friday, except it's science. And the Wednesday night downtown, um, where we'll put signs up saying if you want to talk about forest fires, you can go to the Black Sheep. If you want to talk about uh, something else, go to Oberon, etc. And we're I'm talking to the Chamber of Commerce about setting that up. Um, so, which should be fun and interesting. So, good. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, 
Any other questions? Great, thank you. Anyone here from ASSOU? Next, uh, we have, oh, we can, uh, do we have a motion on the two academic policies uh, introduced last week? Can we rename them? Rename them. You don't know like the names that came with? <laughs> no. <laughs> so the, the first one was the uh, dropping of the 48 uh, credit hour requirement in BA or BS prefixes. Well, I have a question on that. Maybe it's just that not everything printed on here, but in the policy statement under current policies at the very bottom, it says uh, for Bachelor of Arts, it has the first requirement to complete the year of second language and it should say the second year uh, okay. of a second language, and I don't know if that's if that matters or not. But uh, there, it makes it sound like it's one year um, of a second language when it's the second year of a foreign language. Yeah, I'll make sure that's consistent. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So that was uh, that one, and then the. Um, Dropping early registration for online students, so that it's open for the on, the or that online courses are available to everyone, as opposed to online students first. Of course. <coughs> Does it? Would anyone like to make a motion on on either or both of those? I'll make a motion to approve academic policies recommendations for both of their for both. Do I have to name them in some fancy way? Perhaps you could do a little dance. <laughs> dance. Interpreted. <laughs> 48, get rid of, no online. <laughs> so we have a motion to approve both new academic policies. Do we have a second? Second. All right. That's Charles Ling. Gave you a second. Any further discussion on the two academic policies on the table? <coughs> I have a question. Yes. For Matt, can I ask a yes. question for Matt? Please do. Um, Matt, you. you um, mentioned that you might have a system or something for the online degrees. Um, is that still an intention of yours? Yeah, what we'll do this past this, we'll reach out to specific programs because there's a, a few mechanisms we can play with in terms of reserving some seats and doing a few other things that we might mitigate if individual programs have a few best interest in doing that. Yeah, and when, um, assuming this passes here, when would that start? This week, tomorrow, or? Uh, since we are already open on registration for spring term, it would be my intention to probably start it for summer term registration, maybe fall term registration. And, and you were going to no notify those programs or something? So, they, so that they prep themselves, their college students that are uh, accustomed to a privilege there. Correct. Any further discussion? All those in favor of approving the two academic policies proposed, please indicate so by raising your hand. Thank you. All those opposed, please indicate so. Any abstentions? <coughs> All right, the motion passes both. Uh, I can pause it and approve. Yes. May I ask the body of associated question that I should have asked earlier? Sure. So on the BAPS change, we sort of have two options for effective implementation of this. I'm happy to make that alteration now, or we can wait till next catalog cycle. I've already talked through with Jody. Either one is, is perfectly fine. I would just assume we put it in place now so the students are positively affected heading into spring term graduation, but I'm happy to do whatever the body would like to do in that regard. I just didn't know if there was any, any thought either way about it. I don't see a downside in doing it immediately. This is benefit students, but. So I guess, is, is, does anyone vote with the hope that this would not be done immediately? <laughs> <laughs> yes, but not yet. Right. 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 I get the sense it's, it's, a, it's a good thing, and the, the sooner the obstacles drop, the sooner the better. You should think that. I gladly will. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and Dale is not here. Someone else? Do you want to speak for their proposed program? 
to a separate university studies committee drive. So although um, the course proposals are, or the uh, <coughs> studies proposals are not in our Senate drive, you should have access to that. If you don't see that in your team drive, um, let Lee know and make sure that you get added to it. Absolutely, because everything that we bring forward to you, the complete proposal that we've looked at, we deposit in that drive for you to have access to. <coughs> any other questions about any of the other courses? Um, may I have one question? Am I, am I reading this correctly that um, Music 210 um, was a four voted to approve and three were voted not to? Um, or wanted, wanted it to be revised before approving? Or? Uh, there was some conversation around that it, as far as the, this was, there was, how do I just put this? This was one of those courses that came in and then it was resubmitted because it was missing some information and yeah. part of it was because the person submitting was on sabbatical uh, and so it didn't have a full syllabus with it. Okay. And so that was part of it. Once it came through again, it went through with okay. a, a, a form. So there weren't three voting not to approve it? 
they were waiting for additional information okay. before they made the vote. Okay. At the, the day that we did the vote, there were four present that voted yes. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And for the transparency, just keeping it up there. But that's a great question. Thank you. Sure. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay, so we'll put this on the agenda for two weeks from now. All right, where are we at now? All right, that brings us to the directors. All right, so good. We have a, a little extra time now. Um, I do know we have a hard out for this conversation at um, 5.15 because we have the articulation summit downstairs um, that the directors need to get to. Um, so we have a now extra 10 minutes, so we should, that should be plenty of time, I hope. Um, so, uh, you know, just to recap, we all have the uh, report that was sent to us uh, by the division directors that was based on questions that were originally authored by the previous advisory council um, and then um, expanded a little bit by me uh, that they answered those questions um, to begin this conversation. Um, Sherry, I've you were the original contact, so I don't know if you want to sort of um, begin the conversation, but uh, I think the kind of key question for Senate is, um, you know, at the end of, in response to question seven, there's sort of a number of um, suggestions from the directors about uh, essentially bylaws changes that might be considered. So did you want to give a kind of summary presentation first and let's... I can have a question okay. before we go to stuff, just okay. because I don't understand the context in which these questions were originally generated. So, I can so start it came them. from Senate. I mean, it says mm -hmm. Senate inquiry. So why would Senate inquiry? So just to recap, okay. last year, a bylaw proposal came forward from the Constitution Committee uh, that had to do with changing the, um, the language around post-tenure review expectations um, around and or, uh, whether, whether or not um, service and research should be evaluated separately or combined, um, and that bylaw failed. It did, was not passed by Senate. Um, my understanding, because I was not in, on advisory council at that time, was that after that vote, the advisory council discussed it further and decided to um, ask uh, the division directors for um, evidence of a, a process that was not effective. Um, and, and the advisory council did come to the full Senate and ask us if it was a good idea to ask the division directors some questions. I think we all sort of said, yeah, that sounds good. Um, and, and then that was the last I knew about it until the questions um, it was put to me of, of, oh, when are we getting those questions? And then I did some homework, found the questions, and sent them to the division directors. So um, the questions were originated uh, by Kimball and Dennis, and Sue gave some feedback on those questions as well. Um, I polished them up just a little bit, um, <coughs> just expanded them a little, and then sent them to the division directors. Thank you. Sure. Sure. So this came up to my understanding around two things. Um, one is that we have conditions for what is um, deficient progress, I think it's, it's called. Um, at the very end of the colleague evaluation, you can find that there are deficiencies. If you find deficiencies, there are certain processes that have to follow that are quite strict around the colleague evaluation. But the bar is fairly low because essentially what we say for a new incoming faculty member we're expecting them to put in kind of acceptables across all of the tables. As they promote to associate, at least one of those should rise to preferred. When they're tenured, two should rise to preferred. When they're full prof, all three should rise to preferred, except for the averaging um, option that's in there. But once you are post-promotion, post-tenure, there, there's nothing about what that standard ought to be that a faculty member maintains. Or, 99% of the faculty, that's not a big issue. It probably is not a big issue for the people in this room by evidence that you are in this room serving on this committee. Um, but there are some situations where we do run into problems, and they're minority situations, but we don't really have tools to handle them. 
And so one of the requests was to give us some kind of tools to handle them. One might be to add a, um, another piece to the chart that says what's normally expected of somebody who holds this level and have a uh, post-tenure, post-promotion standard. What would the columns be? Um, and we could set that. That is an option you could take. Um, what you asked then, coming back out of all of that discussion, was, well, is there really a problem? And that's what caused these questions. I must admit we dodged some of your questions, some, because it didn't feel like it was quite asking the right question. And finally, we took some liberties with the seventh question to try to tell you where we really see some holes and where there could be some improvement. And I probably should have gotten out my iPad, which is much wider than the hole here. Wait, back up. <laughs> So um, can I ask a clarification? So when you say dodged, like on question seven, no, where we it, so you, you, the question says how many times in the past five years have division directors found the current evaluation process insufficient to address <coughs> unacceptable faculty <coughs> performance? Nowhere in the answer was there a number given. No, seven wasn't. So one through three, it's very okay. easy to give you numerical results. Okay. Yes. Those are all out of the faculty tracking. Correct. Right. Um, for three, you asked us about faculty members' performances being rated. The problem is we do not rate performance. That's not part of the FPAR process. So that is a question where we kind of dodged what you were asking because we aren't in the position <coughs> of making those ratings. Those are um, self-rated. Number four. Number four. She said three. Because at, when you fill out your FPAR, you self-rate. And then it's not in our list of acceptable things to do to rate you. We can communicate back to you, but we don't have any evaluative role in that. So it's part of what we mentioned in seven. Uh, when you come to five, you just asked a quantitative number. It was easy to answer. When we came to six, you asked about finding deficiencies. The way that the bylaws are currently written, it is very difficult to get that low of R and public evaluation committees are very hesitant <coughs> to mark anyone deficient. And so it rarely occurs, I don't think, because we never have a problem back with a member, I think it's because we never want to take that step. Um, and so we didn't have a hard number for you. Um, in our collective memory, we could come up with barely a handful of instances. Excuse me, but that's totally anecdotal. They, you were asked for um, numbers, and if you're telling me we're supposed to just go on anecdotal, like we remember this as a collective group of people, that's not very compelling. None of us had a number that we could identify for the so last five So maybe the numbers years. are so low that there's no number to There is no number because the frequency is so low. Sherry, can I ask you a question? Yes. On uh, number four, um, I, I, I get your point that um, division directors don't rate the performance. However, when, when I did my FCAR, Katie said, wrote a comment, and I got a sense that I was on tr that my self-evaluation was right. Um, so if someone did submit a, an FCAR that a division director felt had some of these issues that you that you raised, for instance, um, uh, little to no supporting evidence, um, or ratings that don't appear to align with the program's ex expectations, um, uh, that so the division asked, director would not say something to that effect. You could ask them to provide better evidence for their rating, but the problem is there isn't evidence on some. Um, and I have gotten some who just said I didn't do any scholarship, but my scholarship is still accepted. So, I, yeah, I agree, Andrew. It, it's implied. The, the process itself is implied that it's going to pa it's, it's in workflow, so it's going to pass through the chairperson and then on to the director. And there's now an opportunity, a box to provide that evidence. But right now, the bylaws do not say that we should give you any feedback at all. It says they'll F, F part shall be submitted to the director on an annual basis. Uh, or sorry, F pass. This is old English. Yeah, the F par shall be forwarded annually through the director to the provost. So it does nothing more. It than doesn't the say box. comment. 
for the record. You know, so I feel, you know, frankly, I gave the same, you know, kind of feedback, but without much cover in the bylaws for that feedback, good or bad. So I need clarification. Are directors able to give some, you indicated your director was able to give you some feedback. Yes. So the tool I have provides... never received any feedback, and I don't know if that's good or bad, and, but I'm just saying, so the capability exists to, in the present way it's set up, for a director to give individual faculty feedback based on their avatars. The activity insight tool does allow the directors. To okay, so it, so maybe I missed it and I got the feedback and I didn't know it. How did you know you got it? You, you, you think it was emailed to you? Okay, so I have never received it. So so that's you know. my confession, Carol. I am very late and it's on my list, but I've been swamped. Okay, so that is my so that's okay. So there is feedback. So yeah. I think that's what I'm But there's no grounds for um, any action taken on that feedback, any weight to that feedback, um, and, or even any right to give that feedback. Or we created a tool that allows it, but the bylaws don't say anything about it. So that's what we were suggesting is maybe in there be something in there that says it's not just we created a tool that does something outside the bylaws. But the bylaws actually don't require it. say something in that nature. Mark? Going off what Carol was talking about here earlier, so the evidence is we don't have the problem. Or we have so few problems that it's tiny. Yeah? Well, but you said there's evidence that people put their acceptable with doing nothing, so that indicates there is a problem. It's just they're not they're accurately not evaluating themselves. Well, we have a you know, very Maybe. small number of people. Very small. So there's, but there are people who are doing like no scholarship and are proudly proclaiming it in their cars. I would at least like to see them dodge it a little. Then I would like to do it. And I could have done that in the opposite problem. People are underreporting, and I'm yeah. reminding them in that feedback. You should really talk about this, and you should add this. And it's one of those things where, especially as they go up for promotion down the road, that going back to those F parts becomes so important for remembering mm -hmm. all the wonderful things that you did. So, in, in my particular piece, is, is reminding faculty about some of the things they might want to remember because when we get to it, I know there's a bunch of things that kind of fall off, and uh, we want to report it, especially in those areas. Yeah. But this conversation is about post it. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> and, and the most common problems is in post kind of like, why am I bothering? Yeah. I'm not yes. going up for promotion, there's no fee. Dan and then John. Yeah, and, and I, I think your question kind of gets at, is there a problem or not? Well, I, is it for me to decide that? When I look at the FPAR, um, in, you know, I find that there are a lot of people that, I think you're saying it's under-reporting that. They, they talk about, maybe the student about Speaking of teaching, they'll talk about the student evaluations, and that's basically it. But if you look at the bylaws, there are a whole lot of other criteria that you have to meet to get to those various levels of, uh, you know, acceptable, uh, preferred, and mm -hmm. exceptional. So they're not addressing that. I'm quite certain, you know, in many cases they're doing those, they're just not including those. Mm -hmm. So I give the feedback, hey, you know, please address these other five things, you know. But if they've already said. I'm preferred or I'm exceptional, and their chairperson said I agree. Um, you know, you've got two two pieces of the evaluation. It's already kind of gone down that path, and I have to say, well, no. Hold, let's call time out. Give me the additional documentation for that. I mean, that's where I feel a little out on a limb because I don't really have that authority in the bylaws to say that. Okay. So, do you want to respond to that before? I have a yeah, so, so I'm, I'm just trying to understand from the director's perspective, because I only know it from the faculty perspective. So if, like, let's say I do my F part, and you're my director, and I turn it in, and you say, you're missing some things, can you send it back where it's not accepted? Or is it still, because I said I'm done, I provided everything. Um, I don't think I have the ability, I, I, I'll look. Um, so that's where it gets tricky. The, in workflow, it's meaningless if there's no, like, you yeah. can't say you need to provide more stuff. You definitely get 
feed, you get a note from your, when your director right. completes it, there's a note. I know right, right, and I've gotten that from my director. Yeah. And you could, you could add, but I'll look and see, because I don't know if there's a, there to like send it back to the chair. If the directors are giving feedback that there's, but nothing happens after that. Right. right. Right, no, we don't return. Yeah. John, did you have more? Yeah. All I, I would just invite, too, that, you know, Mark, when you say, hey, is there a problem? Well, is there? And to look at, well, the basis to judge that is how many deficiencies are caught. I would just invite, too, to, that we broaden the thinking a little bit. The, the, the sole purpose of post-tenure review is not simply to uh, I do identify deficiencies and then try to correct them. I think there's a much richer opportunity to approach post-tenure review in a way that is supportive and collaborative to, hey, what are your, articulating your goals, exploring that, helping figure out how we as departments and, and divisions can support those. Uh, you know, so there's a whole other aspect of this that goes far beyond just identifying deficiencies that I think there's just untapped potential uh, to use this in a, in a much more meaningful and supportive way. And so I, I just worry about framing this solely in terms of, you know, a, a deficit model of what this is designed to do. So I have two questions. So this is coming from directors, but it also references chairs. And I feel like the role of the chair is really important because the chair of your program <coughs> I would assume, would know more detail about the faculty members. So I think that's what Lee was getting to, and, and sometimes saying, you know what, you didn't even report all these other things you did. Um, so, but in this report, when I read it, it was sort of implying that the chairs were also not doing their job because they were rubber stamping oh, no. something. No, I think it's uh, there, it says, well, number four. Well, it says chairs frequently and for a variety of reasons do not give evaluative feedback. To me, that says the chair is not really considering it seriously. Maybe that's not what it meant. That's what it says. So I think the role of the chair is very important, and I think that's where a faculty member should get some feedback, correct, on their um, FPARs. But my second question is, what is the intent or function of the F part? What's its function? We've morphed it into something bizarre over many years, and it becomes part of, and I think you might be able to speak to this, um, accreditation approval to make sure people are doing something. This post-tenure review has always been in the books. Maybe it wasn't closely followed on a schedule. I think we got docked for that, that people weren't doing it after they were fully promoted and tenured. They weren't, there wasn't a time scale. So I think, as I recall, during the accreditation, there was something about people need to be on, on schedule. Well, so I, they don't I, go for you know 10 years without ever being having a yeah. colleague evaluation. I'm, I'm sure there's language in there. But, uh, but, I, but I guess I'm puzzled because the post-tenure review language exists in the bylaws. It was written by faculty. I don't know. OK. So we, the tool that we use to record the information has, has changed, changed, but the substance of the information is okay. matches. So, so again, what is the function, the purpose of the F bar? Like, to what? I mean, I look at it as a tool for faculty to record what they've mm -hmm. done, to make sure they they see some things that you know where they can improve or where they haven't been able to have as much time to do scholarship. What can they do differently in the future? Mm -hmm. But I've never really understood then what happens to that information. And that's always been sort of out there, like who reads it, where does it go, what's done with it. And if, is that the function of it? I mean, I just, I don't know. I'm just bringing out what is the function of it? What's the intent? Maybe we don't need it, is what I'm going to suggest. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. Well, I, I, I really do enjoy reading the FPARs every year. I, I find out incredibly important things about, about the, what the faculty are working on, so especially our junior for faculty. Okay. But mm -hmm. certainly, um, for me personally, it's rewarding and meaningful to see what folks are doing. Um, and generally, mm -hmm. I learn quite a lot. Okay. So for you, it's useful information just so you can see what everybody's doing, because you can't know what everyone's doing. Correct. 
in the last couple of years, the, the activity inside has made it meaningful in the sense that it goes into your work as well. You know, it used to be that we did it in the fall, and it was an afterthought after you got back, and people scrambled to put something together, and they turned it in on the paper, yeah. and it just sat in someone's desk. Now it goes to the chair. Mm -hmm. As director, I can see what comments the chair made, and I can give some you know, feedback mm -hmm. if necessary, or at least kind of get a sense yeah. of how that faculty is doing and how the chair feels for what it's doing. That type of pathway didn't occur before very often. So mm -hmm. I, I think that the fact that it's now going through activity insight gives uh, us as directors, I assume as chairs, uh, to speak of that. But uh, you know, it alerts them that it's there, and one other aspect I'd just share from an administrative perspective is, you know, as a faculty member, I always there's so much in work that we do or you do now that's invisible, and I think this is is an opportunity to make visible what has been invisible so that others can one acknowledge it, recognize it, and then figure out how to. Uh, reward it appropriately and support it. Uh, yeah. So it, it, it's getting at least stuff out on the table. Now what do we do with this, right? And so a chair, a director, the provost office all being part of that, oh well at least now we know, and now what? And so the, and now what, I think is part of the conversation that post-tenure review potentially gets us into mm -hmm. is, what, right. is how can we do a better job so John, honoring that's, that. That's now. really a positive response. And I appreciate that. And um, and some of the issues might be some people just aren't very good at how tooting their own horn, mm -hmm. you know, and and might not even consider writing down all sorts of things because mm -hmm. we do forget and we're old and we forget more. And, you know, and we have ten million so, other things to do. Yeah. So, <laughs> but uh, so I appreciate that you're looking at it very positively. But I have to say when I read this. I did not find this document like a positive affirmation of something. I found it more punitive, like, you know, there, but I'm glad that's been clarified. It's a very small percentage of people that maybe aren't taking them seriously or doing them completely. Um, but it, it, that's not what came across to me. Well, to be fair, the framing maybe for the director questions. was, is there this problem? So oh, okay. focus focused on the problem. Oh, okay. But, you know. So maybe there isn't a problem, but we need to discuss details of how to do something better. Right. And, and the other thing I'll, I'll just put a pin in for everybody is that I'm hoping that in two, week, in two weeks when we come back together for our, our final Senate meeting, uh, that members of the fa faculty personnel committee are going to come forward and talk about FPAR as well. Okay. Um, I, I sent them um, some questions about the FPAR process uh, when um, Anna and Maggie uh, in particular have raised questions about how the FPAR process works, um, what, whether it is meaningful um, for, for faculty, and they sent me they sent me a rough report. I asked them to put it in a little more detail because it really felt like notes that would be hard for us to follow the, on the discussion, but um, it seemed like they were able to draw up um, some discussion points for us to send about the timing of FRs and all those kinds of things, but also that there's a lot of opportunity for training faculty, especially incoming faculty. Um, you know, we do a lot of training about how to use activity insight. There's not much in the way of how to write meaningfully about your work in an FR. What should go in an FR, what you're communicating in an FR, who the audience of the FR is and why that matters. Uh, and so I'm, I think there's some positive work to happen in that, in that direction. So one of the positive, Carol, is um, I frequently don't have to go back to faculty to ask them about now how many faculty in your program were serving on committees outside of the department or how many faculty were doing this or how many faculty were doing that. Because I can pull um, the FPARs and pull that information out. And so in some sense, when it pulled out well, it really saves a lot of back and forth that costs you time in reiterating the same information multiple times. And so there is that benefit of having a repository that holds those kinds of information. Uh, and and we need to get more consistent across that with the big right? right. It seems like there's three issues at the same time, and maybe I'm off, but one of them is what is the purpose of the FPAR? How can we make better FPARs as faculty for our own well-being? Because I know Dan gave me comments like, well, you didn't mention anything about mentoring new faculty, and I know that you did that, and I've forgotten. Right. I didn't. To my own horn, or I forgot it, I didn't think it was important, but 
you know, he made mention of it, and okay. So one is the role of FPARS, two is post-tenure review, and, and from what I gather from the bylaws, every five years there should be a colleague evaluation, which I would assume to be a post-tenure review, and then three is should there even be post-tenure expectations? So it sounds like there's possibly three different charges, the role of the FPAR, what are post-tenure expectations, and what is the post-tenure process? So, okay, that's, that seems like there's three separate yeah, issues yeah. here, yeah. and, and yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. sure. Andrew, I, I think Brian hit on uh, something important with the, the post-tenure process and this, you know, who is deficient, how many people have been deficient. Um, there are several faculty that have gone beyond five years for that colleague evaluation. So mm -hmm. maybe the first question is, how regular are we about colleague evaluations? Um, we had a recent, um, a faculty member recently that retired, and the last recent, most recent um, evaluation that we had on file was from 1998. Um, so there are those people. Is the, is who instigates the colleague evaluation process? Is that that's the chair? Within the program. Yeah. So if that's happening, is that ultimately the, the, the failure of the chair? There would have been multiple chairs. Right. Exactly. <laughs> 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 um, I just want to say uh, I find the FBAR is very useful for recognition. Uh, we give FBAR awards to outstanding faculty, and there's some people sitting in this room who receive them. But it's a way to recognize really unusual, great work that otherwise wouldn't be recognized. Well, I'm just going to speak to what Karen said. That I mean, I think that I've heard anecdotally that there are faculty who are nearing retirement who, you know, who see it in the distance and are saying, you know, I'm not doing another one of those. So if the faculty puts their foot down and doesn't turn in their papers and doesn't do the stuff, I mean, the chair, there's only so much the chair can do, right? I was, when I was a chair, I had a faculty member that we asked for additional information, and it was two years before we got the additional information. It's, you know, there isn't a, what can you do to make somebody turn that in? Mm -hmm. so, so. Yeah. Very briefly, I did check AI. You can send it back to the chair, to the previous step. I don't know what they then do with it. Maybe so they can then send it back. Yeah. Yeah. The chair yeah. send it back. Mm -hmm. So it seems to be a, a useful quantifying kind of question, which I think gets to what you were talking about, is how, uh, with, with what fidelity are we adhering to that five-year calendar? So rather than how many people have been deficient, which seems like uh, that's a fuzzy number, we don't know what is deficient, how good are we at sticking to our own bylaws, which say every five years? That would be a useful thing. So that is in the report. Okay. There are 37 tenured faculty that have a colleague evaluation that is academic year 13, 14, or newer. And the total number of tenured faculty that we looked at was 79. But it, over time, but, though, yeah, that's, that's, in, like, that's, a, that's a snapshot, and it's interesting. So that's a snapshot of our current faculty as of um, when I uh, prepared right. this. Right. So this was off of last year's faculty. That current faculty had 79 tenure track faculty, and only 37 of them had had a colleague evaluation in the last five years. So, so all the rest of them either didn't have one or it was older. Right. So that's saying that half of them are not satisfactory if we take back track of that data. They're not timely. Right. They may be satisfactory. Well, I mean, if they don't they're turn it in, they're not satisfactory. No, it's, or not turn it in, sorry, but if they aren't evaluated, yeah, there's no... Them. They don't right. say, hey, well, I guess that's time true. for me to be evaluated. Come on, Rusty, you do it. It should be coming the from, from their chair. Right. Um, where, I'm just wondering how you found out how many colleague evaluations were done in the last five years. So there's a faculty talk, tracking document that Karen has started that's maintained by the provost office. Every time a colleague evaluation is completed, it, it gets dated in there with the faculty member's records where we track what your current SIP code is, what your current year and rank is, all of this sort of thing. It also tracks your current, most current colleague evaluation. So they're so, loaded in, a, in activity and say, well, I'm in Activity Insight, and I know that it, I can put in there when the last time I received FERPA training was, when was the last time I received sexual harassment training. Is it possible that I could put in there, here's the date of my last 
colleague evaluation because I'll be chair next year. So, you would like to so I would like to say, okay, Dave needs a colleague evaluation mm -hmm. and I'm chair and I can start the process right now. So at least if, if my recommendation to, to at least put the information at the chair disposal to avoid, you know, musical chairs, you like that? Um, but in order to do that, once, a, once somebody becomes chair, they at least have the information because they have access to this and say, hey, you're due, and that would, that I would hope, have more timely colleague evaluations, which would be post tenure for for everybody. No, Karen? and and that was the function of the faculty tracking document is to give them and chairs have access to that. And so not it's I'm not a chair yet, so. <laughs> so you don't have access to it yet. But so it's a it's a download from Activity Insight, and we update who has it submitted their FRs and their colleague evaluations. Uh, before we had Activity Insight. Colleague evaluations were held just in programming departments. Mm -hmm. And so, in about academic year 14 15, when everything else happened and we got, you know, brought on activity inside right behind that, uh, we beat the bushes to try to get um, most mm -hmm. recent, um, the most recent colleague evaluations so that we could upload those. And mm -hmm. um, so we pulled through and we pulled those out, and that's what's sitting out there right now. Is most recent college evaluations for each individual. I have a question for the, I guess, all the division directors. What conversations are you having with the chairs about this block of people who have not been evaluated recently? Well, and to tail onto that, have you even told the chairs that these people are, like, have you communicated that? Yeah. So, so I confess I'm delinquent in getting my F course returned to the faculty. I want to also say, though, I think. All my faculty have a current colleague evaluation within the last five years. But that took a lot of really diligent work with my chairs and uh, faculty to get them caught up. And I actually created a schedule. And we did let those that were near retirement fall off the list as chairs were trying to catch up. Mm -hmm. So anybody who had relinquished tenure, I didn't push that we catch them up. But we caught up everyone who had not. And it took us four years to yeah. do it because we had to spread it out yeah. so that we could get them all caught. But there is community. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's it. And yeah, that, that to is share your credit, so there is also some confounding factors. For instance, when a department has too many junior faculty mm -hmm. members, which is mm -hmm. unusual for some of us, but um, then you don't have enough faculty members to be on the college evaluation. I so I am on a college evaluation for chemistry. But mm -hmm. I'm on a colleague evaluation, like I was mm -hmm. on a colleague evalu evaluation last year of a tenured professor. Mm -hmm. Technically, right. that's not cool. Right. But <laughs> just let you know, know, that's how we yeah, get it. And that's what I'm saying, that's part of the right. problem. Right. And that's why it takes that. longer sometimes. So. But I think that also speaks to part of the issue when this originally came up was, what levers do we have if performance is deficient? Or are we signaling that someone's deficient? That when we have colleague reviews, sometimes if you're a junior faculty, you're not in that faculty's program, you don't, you can't or don't feel comfortable giving mm -hmm. the kind of feedback that would tell a tenured full professor that, hey, you need to do more here. Oh, yeah. That whether the evaluation steps that we have in place allow for the kind of honesty and evaluation that we need. It does happen with colleague evaluations, especially when you've got several in the program. You've got someone going up for tenure, someone going up for full, someone who needs a colleague email and their small program. You're pulling people in from lots of different places. If they haven't worked closely with the person for many years, it can be difficult to criticize them when people tend to, to gloss over certain things. John, that could be. Well, and just as we wrap up my part and, and head downstairs, I just want to reflect back to that, and, and I don't think this is just semantics, but we, 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 we still find ourselves navigating back and forth where we're talking about uh, colleague review and colleague evaluation. Mm -hmm. And a post-tenure review, a colleague evaluation is a tool and a part of that process, but doesn't necessarily need to be equated with it, right? And so again, if, if we're looking at, at really a serious conversation about post-tenure review, it's not simply an evaluation. I think there's a richer way of approaching that and, and reminding ourselves of that is probably helpful. Just 
quick point. One of the things that we talked about last year when this came up and Dennis and Campbell started their work was um, this, the question was, should there be a different set of expectations developed mm -hmm. for post-tenure faculty? Maybe it, and I, I don't have a thought one way or the other, other than to put it out there because the conversation was the set of expectations that currently exist are for promoting faculty. And so they're, so it's, it, they're speaking to something um, in, uh, in some ways that, that don't necessarily apply to them as they would an assistant or associate professor. I'm just saying that that came up, and I am not advocating, but it, it is a piece of the conversation that we haven't touched on. Yeah, I do remember, I think if Kimball were here, he, he might re restate his, his argument, I think at the time had been, well, what, you know, it, a full professor, maybe at that point, they decide they're not going to focus so much on research, but really focus on service and teaching, and, you know, maybe that's okay, and, um, so maybe we consider. I really appreciate the discussion. I think it's so important to think about how we all work together to be our best selves, right? And how we can give feedback that helps everybody, uh, all of us, do our jobs even better than we already do them. Perhaps it's because I've been thinking about the legislature so much. I just want to remind you that we're like one slip away from something becoming public. In this day of social media, in you know, you have one student who says, I ask, and this professor hasn't been evaluated in eight years, and it goes viral. I can tell you in the legislature, they have long memories of anecdotes, mm -hmm. and you can provide tons of evidence, and it doesn't necessarily change the anecdote that sticks in their mind. And so let's have a robust discussion and make sure that we're not creating a vulnerability for the institution in that way. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Watch what you write down there, Melissa. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah, question for the directors if you uh, want to get them out here on time. So if there's a final burning question. Well, I'll make a comment to the directors since they're leaving. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a comment, not a question. Just get out of here. <laughs> it, it, this this uh, discussion it was initiated um, not as not as an FPAR accountability question. Right. It was more like if we rethink the, the performance standards for post-tenure review, mm -hmm. especially for professorial uh, rank, after professorial rank, what are the performance expectations? Mm -hmm. And so that's where the more positive mm -hmm. um, collegial um, uh, shared governance discussion should be, and not really like counting what's in the boxes. It's really about how, how people can contribute to their to their best selves, but it might be um, uh, in a certain area, and that might be something that the directors can, can help shape, really. I mean, I, I, I'm not going to say that we've agreed on this with the Faculty Senate. This was more, um, you know, a couple people trying, being offended by the um, the lack of accountability for, you know, the highest rank. Um, so, Senate may not agree with this whole discussion, but we felt, you know, Emily and I felt that it was, it was worthwhile to put it forward because we respect our profession and we, and we think we ought to be contributing in a lot of different ways. Well, I thank you all uh, for joining us today. I'll let you get on your way, thank you so much. Fun to serve. Don't give away the farm. Okay, I'll try that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, I, I think I think we should. And like I said, the FCC piece will come in um, talk about that aspect of the F part. I think it will really like, combine with some of the points we just discussed. Are they 
coming to tell us things or to like discuss? I think they're coming to present the discussion that they had and then we will discuss further. So, but what I'm also asking is, um, can, I assume senators should be sharing this information yes. with their department faculty Absolutely. or faculty at large because I'm pretty sure most faculty haven't really looked very closely at this Thing, this document. So, um, yeah, so I, mean, I didn't know I, where we were going with it. Sure, I mean, the Senate good. has had the, the document and the responses since fall. Right. Um, so I hope people have been sharing them with, with all, I mean, all faculty have, because I, I do mm -hmm. share them with the right. everyone. But, um, yeah, absolutely. These discussions should continue, and right. uh, especially if we are going to consider any Change. Senate action, like yeah. bylaws changes, absolutely. Um, just quickly, um, I, I'll tell you the, the, um, I'll read uh, what I sent to FTC. So this is what I think they're going to respond to. Uh, to you. Um, so I, I asked for their review on two issues. One, the onboarding of new faculty to the FPAR process and the tools used to communicate how to complete an FPAR and why. So we are unsure of how the FPAR is discussed during orientation. We also hear that current trainings do an excellent job of addressing the technical process of completing the FPAR but that more training could be offered on how to actually write a good FPAR and about the meaning, purpose, and audience of the document. Specifically, we think both new and existing faculty might benefit from the distribution of sample FPARs mm -hmm. and some kind of style guide with a frequently asked questions. A specific question has been raised by multiple faculty about how best to communicate about activity that is in progress and not yet complete. Number two, the deadline review process and feedback loop of the FPAR. Uh, the FR is currently due shortly before the spring term ends. We are aware of some reasons for this, but others may exist of which we're not aware. We would like FEC to review the reasons for the FR timing and consider whether this deadline is indeed the best option. Some faculty members have suggested alternatives, including a deadline at the true end of spring term, at the beginning of fall term, or even a flexible deadline it would be helpful to the conversation to have a better understanding about how any of these alternatives might impact faculty and administrators alike. Related to this issue is the question of meaningful feedback. The suggestion has been raised that chairs need the end of spring to offer meaningful feedback and that directors need the summer. Some faculty report written feedback that amounts to a pat on the back and a little more, raising the issue of whether the work they've put into the FPAR is truly meaningful. We would like clarification about the outcomes expected from the FPAR process and whether current procedures best facilitate those desired outcomes. So they had a conversation um, I think Jody came into the song and danced for them about that part a little bit, and I think um, some others were involved in that discussion too. So they, they are coming with a report um, of some of the factors discussed and some suggestions, but also some, I think, questions back to the Senate for us to consider. Andy, yeah. Could you put that yes. summary of what you sure. said to them in the right? Yes, that would be yes. really helpful. So, you know, it was the provost office that decided on the timing of the FPAR because of faculty insight, because of the inception of using that program. It was switched to that spring time. Well, I think, yes, I mean, technically it would have been the Senate decided because we voted on it, but it was a recommendation from, from the administration. Right. Yeah. Okay. And changing the, you know, and merging the FPAR. So, F I, I really like it point about what's going on with new faculty training because unless you're a new faculty you don't know what they're hearing and who's saying this to them and how much meaning there is like you pointed out they should tell them how to do this thing but that's not helpful I can tell you from my training okay. we had you know when you did it here after me we had new faculty training at the beginning of the fall Mm -hmm. The as far as doing the spring, spring right. there was no, no all of a sudden I just had to do this thing and right. my chair gave me an example of her old one, mm -hmm. but there was no training. If they talked about it at the very beginning, it, would have been it was gone right. from my brain by that point. And in, in, in my experience, you know, Precious Yamaguchi and I were brought on as one years, or, or you know, one uh, year by Whatever, whatever. Term, right, term, 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 term by term. Not term by term, but that we were. Yeah, year long. Yeah, year long. And we were told not to do FBARs. Right. Yeah. Um, and then um, in our second year, uh, when they were going to convert us, they said, oh, we need your FBARs. All like, you, you told us not to do them. And so we never even got any, any training on them. We yeah. just said, here, go do an FBAR. So, okay, uh, so that addresses the issue of a year long is not a 
tenured track position, therefore you wouldn't be doing enough. But many are, but more but and many more are often converted. there are people are being hired or, as well, year long as they converted. Professional, professional but they, they were brought on as yeah. one year, but, we don't know. Right. right. That's just that's the, different. That's the chair should have told you to do it. I mean, I we had a Let's bunch see, of one years too, and and I said it, you don't have to, but you should. Yeah. But because that's the possibility be, of being. And that should be right. universal, and that's the problem. So many people are getting different information, and so you, it really sets up junior faculty to fail, mm -hmm. and we don't want that to happen. Mm -hmm. We took all this time to get the best people we have. And then we don't give them enough information on how to be successful and how to do these things. And we get this document that I will still say is extremely punitive. And it's essentially ranting about we're not good at self-evaluation. You're not good at having chairs evaluate and write. I mean, that's not helpful. And so I appreciated John King's comments that he was trying to frame it positively. So, so you might have noticed that was a little tense. <laughs> no. I never know. So, no. <laughs> so it's really good I sit this way. But, but I, I just, I think there's so many things that are, that we don't talk about that are really not, we're not helping our junior faculty as much as we could. Or consistently, even older faculty. Like, now what are you supposed to do? <laughs> kind of thing. So I, yeah, I mean, I think everybody works really hard here, and I, I get tired of hearing about them. Enrique? Yeah, are the chairs also receiving some training to how to evaluate the parts or something? Okay. Because I don't, and also I don't think, I don't think there's are you? some, some... Uh, I, the manual hasn't been updated since 2013. <laughs> That's a good point. Because, for example, in my case, um, I was, my class were observed by four colleagues, my very first semester, twice. And I have talked to other colleagues from other departments, and they have never been observed. Uh, my colleagues wrote uh, uh, some reports about what they saw in my classes. And then at the end, on, on the F bar, <coughs> the most, what, what the chair said about my classes, what, uh, basically what she saw. So she didn't report like she had, like, the other colleagues saw it, and it was good. But well, he made a mistake in this part, and I think, he should know this and that, and he should improve in that because he included these materials that were not appropriate, and so on, and so on, and so on, and that's it. So, <clears throat> why, in my case, why observing me that many times for different colleagues, and then the end just. And, and, and it's very different from other uh, departments. As president of the Senate, I don't know if you have this power, but <laughs> I have no power. I know you don't. I know you don't. But we're going to give you some I would be willing to put my name forward for you to contact any new faculty that if they want information or a training session on FPARS, or even when I've gone as a new faculty mentor, whatever that means. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we go to these meetings, we meet people, and then there's nothing. I've reached out to uh, Associate Provost Waters and said, hey, I will do a, I've been on faculty personnel committee, I've done colleague evaluation, if they want information on how to navigate promotion and tenure, I will be your huckleberry. So I'm telling you that if you reached out or if anybody reached out, I will have a symposium for them. So you if have anybody been else. willing to do this? I, I've all, you all, all I've, like, Amy Bell Castro and I were on yeah, academic yeah, policy yeah. committee last year and in the process of evaluating promotions and tenure last year, we said, this, and she was also a new faculty member, we both got together and sent a letter to Vicki, who's no longer here, Suter, who was the one in charge of that. And, and then after she didn't reply to me after like three weeks, I sent it to Jody, and she finally said, yeah, that's a great idea. But then nothing. It's just fizzled. But I sent it to administration, and I'm sending it in a public recorded meeting that I would be willing <laughs> to well, do that. Now. Because I work on a whole hall of new faculty, and so it, it would be, they always say how beneficial it would be. So exactly what are you offering? <laughs> I'm offering it's information service. and knowledge on FPAR completion, what is required, and, and navigating promotion and tenure applications tenure. that are outside the chair, because if, if we're worried that the chair is not giving feedback, I'm Or that fairly the chair is overburdened. Yeah. Good. I'm ready to sign up. Yeah. <laughs> we're in, we're in. So I, yep. I think See? Yep. Yeah, the two first people here.
Excellent. One of the things that needs to be clarified is this language around evaluation or promotion and tenure, right? Because it is, um, people say, oh, the F cards is basically just a report of the things you've been involved in, and so there's really no evaluation process, blah, 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 you know, you're just getting feedback. But in reality, that's not true, because the F cards are required when you do go up for right. promotion and tenure. Right. So the idea is, if it were clearly linked that this is a process of evaluation for the future, I think people would definitely see it as more important and put that effort into it rather than, oh, nobody's looking at it because it's just giving me a little bit of feedback in the moment. If you could formalize how that works through that evaluation process, I think that would be very helpful for people. So it's not the evaluation itself, but it's one step in a process of evaluation later. That's really important. And that, that's really important because when I've done this, so I've caught up on a lot of them um, over the last couple of years, Part of it is we'll do a, what. What's the purpose of this? As you were saying, what's the purpose of this? And I said, well, you, it is. It's not a formal evaluation, but it's one piece of a much larger evaluation. So if we could, if we could have that message conveyed, people might be able to. I think. Sorry, I, as a not so new newish person, I think that member, I didn't understand that at all. Mm -hmm. That, and I came on the same pathway that you and Precious did. I was year long and then was converted. So at no point did anybody sit down with me and say, so this is how you get promoted. I mean, there was a workshop and Karen and, and folks were there and it was helpless, but it didn't speak to the FR and it didn't say, this is how you're building your case <coughs> for promotion and tenure. This, this is your record keeping. Right. Make sure you do it really well. Because within my department, it was all very warm and cozy and everybody said, great, thanks for filling that out. You're doing such a good job, we love you. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I didn't understand. That so there it's, was it's a mixed message. There. It's yeah. a mixed message that, oh, don't worry about it. It's just a little reporting. Right. And we're trying to no, see we know you're doing going. And then at the time when the evaluation comes up, it's like, hey, you're these different. are pretty skimpy. Why didn't you yeah. put other things in there? I have a question for all of you. Uh, I've heard rumors that, you, that at the retreats, People are supposed to be sharing their FPARs mm -hmm. and talking that about. Is, is that a thing that happens in any, any division? In our departmental retreat, no. no. I've yeah. never heard of that. In theater, it does? It happened once in theater, once 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 in theater about eight years ago. <laughs> <laughs> because when it was all still paper, um, and we each formatted and uh, organized in our own way, and uh, Chris Sackett, chair at the time, opened it saying, okay, let's do this, five minutes each person, let's this get this good. done. And, uh, <laughs> so you looked it up. Because uh, no, one we, of the responses went when someone asked, um, why is it due in, in the spring and not the fall? You know, one of them said, well, that doesn't give people time to talk about it at the spring retreats, and I thought, or the fall retreats, well, and I thought, well, that's no, certainly never happened to me. Never. I've never. <laughs> <laughs> we have 30 minute sessions with our chair and you do? Uh, like each person. You see talking for what? Wow. It definitely doesn't happen. That's every year. Every year. That's yeah. Is that cumulatively yeah. over your time here? No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well. Um, How many people in your department? I don't know, 15 or something. Yeah. We'll talk more about this. Um, I want to apologize to Marianne, who is, I think, her third time being bumped from the agenda. I will put her at the top next time. It's not that um, brutal, but I did pass around a sheet that you didn't receive, and there are a couple documents. One is, um, I believe, uh, the letter that, the little note that we sent out uh, to, to our um, committee chairs. So maybe you can just look at that and decide whether you think it's adequate or necessary. Yeah, yeah, and then the other one is an example of a, a report that I got from one of the chairs. And But the bigger question is, do the, the bylaws really match what you expect this committee to be and what it does in reality? So uh, we can discuss that next time. There's no mad rush for it. You, you, can't hold, you don't want to hold on to them because they're really They are also on the drive now. I do that on the drive. It's up to you. I will take them back if you need to. Announcement, I would invite you to our current production of Electra, but it's sold out. Mm -hmm. uh, we extended the run and it instantly sold out. In, in, uh, and so, uh, so there's that. But we do have um, a new show opening this Thursday night. And we'll run for two weekends, no old cowards. Hay Fever, a rollicking comedy to lift your spirits in the middle of the winter. It's pretty, it's funny. They 
act ridiculously from the lab. Thursday. Thursday. Anything else? Thursday. Well, I guess I would say also, please don't come to the French Open door <laughs> because there will be no tickets. And apparently last year, some community people were pretty upset when they showed up and were told that we were sold out. So just to let you know. Thank you all. Adjourn. Thanks.